Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste any discussion of forest protection is incomplete without forest law. Forest law is something that gives us the strength to protect the forest. And in our country, we have three major laws, the Indian Forest Act 1927, the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and the Forest Conservation Act 1980 that provide us with the strength to protect the forest. And in today's lecture, we will have a look at all three of these acts and the major provisions that they have for the protection of forests. So, let us now begin with the Indian Forest Act 1927. To understand any act, we have to go to the preamble of this act. So, this act is act 16 of 1927, an act to consolidate the law relating to forests, the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. So, what is the purpose of this act? This act is to consolidate the provisions that we have relating to forest, transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. So, essentially when this act was made, it was uh, uh, India was under the control of the Britishers and this act was made with a purpose to reserve certain forest, to reserve certain forest produce for the government. Whereas, it is expedient to consolidate the law relating to forest, the transit of forest produce and the duty levyable on timber and other forest produce, it is hereby enacted as follows. So, what are the major provisions that we have in this act? So, we have we begin with the short title and extent followed by the interpretation clause. Now, uh, section 2 of a number of acts gives you the definitions of different terms that are used in the act. So, uh, in this case we can see that what is a forest officer? Any person whom the state government or any office empowered by the state government in this behalf may appoint to carry out all or any of the provisions of this act is a forest officer. What is a forest offence? So, when we talk about protection, we have to talk about the forest offence. A forest offence is defined as an offence that is punishable under this act or any or under any rule that is made there under that is under this act. So, if, if there is an offence that is punishable under this act, you will call it a forest offence. What is a forest produce? So, it, it categorizes different categories of forest produce. The following whether found in a forest or brought for from a forest or not. So, when we say or not, what we uh, what this act is saying is that whether it is these things are found in a forest or whether these are not found in the forest, whether these are brought from the forest or whether these are brought from any other place will if we have these items we will call them a forest produce. And what are these? Timber, charcoal, katechu, wood oil, resin, natural varnish and so on. So, if you if you find these items anywhere it is a forest produce and the act is applicable on these. But in these things, the following when found in a forest. So, if these, if this list, the items that are in this list, if they are found in the forest or if they are brought from a forest, only then we will call them a forest produce. But if these are brought from any other area, if you are growing them in your uh, house and you are able to prove that, then this is not a forest produce. And what does this list contain? Trees and leaves flowers and fruits and all other parts of produce not herein before mentioned of trees, plants that are not trees including grasses, creepers, reeds and moss, all parts or produce of such plants, wild animals and skins, tusk, horn, bones, silk, cocoon, honey, wax and other things, peat, surface, soil, rocks, minerals and so on. So, these are a forest produce only when these are either found in the forest or are these or these are being brought from the forest. Now, what is tree? What is timber? 
Now, timber is defined as trees when they have fallen or have been felled and all the wood whether it is cut up or fashioned or hollowed out for any purpose or not, which means that timber is all, all sorts of trees and all sorts of materials that are uh, that have been derived from these trees whether they have been processed or not we will call them as timber. What is a tree? Now, tree includes palm, bamboo, skump, brushwood, canes. Now, later on with an amendment the bamboos was brought out of this list. So, bamboo is now no longer considered to be a tree. Now, what are the powers of the government? The government has a power to reserve a forest. So, the government can reserve a forest and what is the process and what kinds of lands can be reserved? The state government may constitute any forest land. Now, this any forest land is something that you have uh, defined uh, uh, in the Goda government case that the Supreme Court has defined in the Goda government case. So, a forest land includes all lands that have forest or all lands that have been described as a forest in some document. So, the state government can may constitute any forest land or waste land which is the property of the government or over which the government has proprietary rights that is rights over the property or to the whole or any part of the forest produce of which the government is entitled a reserve forest in the manner here and after provided. So, what kinds of lands can be made into a reserve forest? You can make any forest land into a reserve forest or any waste land into a forest into a reserve forest or any land that uh, over proprietary rights to the whole or to the part of the forest produce. So, if you have any forest land or any waste land which is the government property you can directly convert it into a reserve forest. The process is given in the later article in the later sections you have a notification by the state government you declare uh, which are the areas that are going to be constituted into, into the reserve forest. You specify the limits of this land you appoint a forest settlement officer then there is a bar or on accrual of forest rights. So, once you have uh, issued a notification under section 4 no right shall be acquired in or over the land comprised in such notification except by succession or under a grant or contract in writing made or entered into by or on behalf of the government and so on. Then there is proclamation inquiry next you have the powers of the forest settlement officers. Now, this is important. Now, if you have a forest settlement officer what this forest settlement is doing is that once the government has come up with a notification that we are going to constitute these lands into a reserve forest then this forest officer is going to make a note of who all are living in this area who all are having rights in this area and then is going to process these rights as is provided in the act. So, to, uh, to note down these rights and to process these rights the forest settlement officer is given cer uh, certain powers. For the purpose of such inquiry the forest settlement officer may exercise the following powers that is to say power to enter by himself or any officer authorized by him for the purpose upon any land. So, he can get inside any land he can survey demarcate or make a map of any land and he has the powers of a civil court in the trial of suits. Then there is an extinction clause that certain rights will be extinguished uh, uh, using uh, under, circum, uh, under certain circumstances then a record will be made and so on. Now, let us move into the other clauses of protection. Once the government has declared a land as a reserve forest no right shall be acquired over the reserve forest except as here provided. So, once you have made this land into a reserve forest now no rights can be acquired except as under provided in this act. Now, in this area there uh, section 25 says power to stop ways and water courses in the reserve forest. The forest officer may with the previous sanction of the state government or any or of any officer duly authorized by it in this behalf stop any public or private way or water course in a reserve forest provided that a substitute for the way or water course so stopped which the state government deems to be reasonably con convenient 
already exists or has been provided or constructed by the forest officer in lieu thereof. So, now what we are saying is that the forest settlement officer has the power to stop any way that is to stop any road or to stop any waterway provided that an alternative is provided to the people. So, this is another power of the forest settlement officer. Next we have acts that are prohibited in such forest. So, acts that are prohibited in the reserve forest, what are the acts? Any person who makes a fresh clearing prohibited by section 5 or sets fire to a reserve forest or in contravention of any rules made by the state government in this behalf kindles any fire or leaves any fire burning in such manner as to endanger such a forest. So, what we are saying is that uh, in different areas, in areas that are uh, there in, in section 5 or those that have been declared as a reserve forest, there are different things that are now prohibited. Making of a fresh clearing is prohibited, setting of a fire is prohibited kindling of any fire, leaving any fire burning is prohibited or who in a reserve forest kindles, keeps or carries any fire except as such seasons as the forest officer may notify. So, now in the case of a reserve forest, people may no, not even keep or carry, or carry any fire, which means that if you are entering into this these reserve forest, you have to be extra careful because these are now reserved or trespasses or pastures cattle or permits cattle to trespass. You cannot permit your cattle to enter into a reserve forest or causes any damage by negligence in felling any tree or cutting or dragging any timber. You cannot damage these trees or fells, girdles, lops or burns any tree or strips of the bark or leaves from or otherwise damages the same. All of these are prohibited or quarries stone burns slime or charcoal or collects subject to any manufacturing process or removes any forest produce or clears or breaks up any land for cultivation or for any other purpose. So, breaking up of land is prohibited. In contravention of any rules made in this behalf by the state government, hunts, shoots, fishes, poisons water or sets traps or snares that is also prohibited or in an area in which the Elephant Preservation Act 1879 is not in force kills or catches elephants in contravention of any rules so made, shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months or with a fine which may extend to 500 rupees or with both. In addition to such compensation for damage done to the forest as the convicting court may direct to be paid. So, all of these activities are forest offences under this act. Next, the government can also make village forest under section 28. The state government may make rules for regulating the management of village forest or the government can declare protected forest under section 29. So, what is the difference between a protected forest and a, and a reserve forest? A protected forest is typically a very quick action in which the government says that these forests will be protected and then they become protected forest. But in the case of a reserve forest, the process is very intricate. So, uh, there is a forest settlement officer who inquires into the rights of different people, settles those rights, extinguishes certain rights and then after the whole process is done, you have a reserve forest. Now, the government under section 30 has the power to issue notification reserving trees etcetera. The state government may by notification in the official gazette declare any trees or class of trees in a protected forest to be reserved from a date fixed by the notification. So, the government can not only declare a forest as a protected forest, but inside a protected forest the government can also declare that certain trees or classes of trees are reserved. Or uh, the government can declare that any portion of such forest is specified in the notification shall be closed for such term not exceeding 30 years as the state government thinks fit and that the rights of private persons if any over such portion shall be suspended during such terms provided that the remainder of such forest be sufficient and in a locality reasonably convenient 
for the due exercise of the right suspended in the portion so closed. So, the government can reserve trees in a protected forest or the government can say that a certain portion of the protected forest is now closed. When we say closed, it means it is closed for grazing, but the government will ensure that, uh, uh, that the, the rights of the people are protected by providing certain alternatives or the government can prohibit from a date fixed as aforesaid the quarrying of stone, burning of lime or charcoal or collection or subjection to any manufacturing process or removal of any forest produce in any such forest or the breaking up or clearing of for cultivation, for building, for herding cattle or for any other purpose of any land in such forest. So, even inside a protected forest, the government can, can issue a notification that will say that these activities are also prohibited in the protected forest. So, they also become a forest offence. Next, we have penalties. The penalties are given in section 33. Penalties for acts in contravention of notification under section 30 or of rules under section 32. Any person who commits any of the following offences, namely fells, girdles, lops, taps, or burns any tree reserved under section 30 or strips off the bark or leaves from or otherwise damages any such tree or contrary to any pro, uh, prohibition under section 30 quarries any stone, burns any lime or charcoal, collects or subjects to any manufacturing process or removes any forest produce or contrary to any prohibition under section 30 breaks up or clears for cultivation or any for any other purpose any land in any protected forest or sets fire to such forest or kindles a, a fire without taking all reasonable precautions to prevent its spreading to any tree reserved under section 30, whether standing fallen or felled or to say closed portion of such forest leaves any uh, leaves burning any fire kindled by him in the vicinity of any such tree or closed portion or fells any tree or drags any timber so as to damage any tree reserved as a foresaid or permits cattle to damage any tree or infringes any rule made under section 32. So, now all of these are also forest offences and the act now says that all these things shall be punishable for a, with imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months or with a fine which may extend to 500 rupees or with both. So, all of these are also uh, prohibited activities and uh, penalties have been uh, have been designated for these prohibited activities. And whenever fire is caused willfully or by gross negligence in a protected forest, the state government may not withstanding that any penalty has been inflicted under this section direct that in such forest or any portion thereof the exercise of any right of pasture or to forest produce shall be suspended for such period as it thinks fit. So, essentially in the case of a reserve forest, all the rights are reserved for the government. In the case of a protected forest, certain rights are left for the people, but then if the people uh, carry out any activity in which you have a fire that is caused either willfully or because of gross negligence, then the government may suspend the rights of the people for grazing, collection of non-timber forest produce and so on. So, this act is making uh, known to us what are the offences, what are the forest offences and what are the penalties for them. Next, the act says section 35, protection of forest for special purposes. So, this is now again another power of the government because of this act. The state government may by notification in the official gazette regulate or prohibit in any forest or wasteland. Now, remember that earlier we were talking about forest or wasteland that were the government property for the making of the reserve forests. But now, what we are saying is regulate or prohibit in any forest or wasteland the breaking up or clearing of land for cultivation, pasturing of cattle, firing or clearing of vegetation, when such regulation or prohibition appears necessary for the following purposes. Now, these purposes are public purposes, 
protection against storm, wind, rolling stones, floods, avalanches, preservation of soil on the ridges and slopes and in the valley of hill tracts, the, the prevention of landslips or of the formation of ravines and torrents or the protection of land against erosion or deposit thereon of sand, stones and gravel for the maintenance of a water supply in spring, rivers, tanks, protection of roads, bridges, railways and other lines of communication or for the, the preservation of public health. Now, what we are saying here is that because the forests are having a number of ecological functions that are providing us a number of direct and indirect benefits. So, for these benefits the government may say that in any forest or in any wasteland these activities are prohibited for these particular reasons. So, this is now another power of the state government. The state government may for such purpose construct at its own expense in or upon any forest or wasteland such work as it thinks fit. So, now this section is giving uh, power to the government to, to do certain activities as it thinks fit for these purposes. No notification shall be made under subsection 1 nor shall any work be begun under subsection 2 until after the issue of a notice to the owner of such forest or land calling on him to show cause within a reasonable period to be specified in such notice why such notification should not be made or work constructed as the case may be and until his objections if any and any evidence he may produce in support of the same have been heard by an officer duly appointed in that behalf and have been considered by the state government. So, now uh, this, uh, this section is now also putting up the rider that before any such notice is uh, any such order is issued the person who is having the forest will be given a chance to show cause within a reasonable period of time that we are going to, to do this to your forest and if you have any objections you should show cause why you have these objections and why we should not do this. Now, in under section 36 the government has the power to assume the management of forest in case of neglect of or willful disobedience to any regulation or prohibition under section 35 or if the purposes of any work to be constructed under their, that section so require the state government may after notice in writing to the owner of such forest or land and after considering his objections if any place the same under the control of a forest officer and may declare that all uh, that all or any or of the provisions of this act relating to reserve forest now mind the word here it is reserve forest shall apply to such forest or land and the net profits if any arising from the management of such forest or land shall be paid to the said owner. Now, under uh, section 36 the government is assuming the management of certain forest if the person who is having the forest uh, or is the owner of such forest is not doing things that are proper in the view of the government. So, under these circumstances the government can assume the management of the forest all the uh, provisions of the reserve forest shall uh, apply to such land all those things that are prohibited in a reserve forest shall automatically become uh, uh, prohibited in these uh, uh, forests uh, if the government so declares and when the management is done if there is any profit. So, the net profits so that is the gross profit minus the cost of management will be paid to the owner. Then the government can also do protection of forests at the request of owners the owner of any land or if there is uh, there are more than one owners thereof the owner of shares therein appointing in aggregate at least two thirds thereof may with a view to the formation or conservation of forest thereon represent in writing to the collector their desire that such land be managed on their behalf by the forest officer as a reserved or a protected forest on such terms as may be mutually agreed upon or that all or any of the provisions of this act be applied to such land and in either case the state government may by notification in the official gazette apply to such land the such provisions of this act as it thinks suitable to the circumstances thereof and as may be desired by the applicants. So, what this section is saying is that the if the owner of the forest requests the government that 
they want the, the government to protect their forests on their behalf, then the government may even uh, take action and protect those forests on behalf of the owners. So, that is also another option that is available with the government for the private forests. Now, other powers of the government include the power to impose duty on timber and other forest produce. Now, why is a duty important? It is not only a source of revenue, but also because when you are uh, when you are putting a duty on timber and forest produce, in that case you will be setting up depots and any movement of timber or forest produce shall become regulated automatically. So, people will have to come up with paperwork, people will have to come up with proofs if they have to move timber or forest produce from one place to another place. And this is a very good mechanism to enforce the protection of forest. So, if there is a forest from which timber or forest produce are being extracted illegally. So, uh, the, uh, this mechanism of duties and, uh, and, uh, and centers for collecting these duties will ensure the protection and will ensure that uh, people are not taking out forest or other forest uh, timber or other forest produce illegally from the forest. Next, the government has the power to make rules to regulate the transit of forest produce. And in this case, the government can prescribe the routes by which alone timber or, or other forest produce may be imported, exported or moved in from or within the state. So, now the government can say, okay, you can move your timber, but only on these routes, because only on these routes we will have to check uh, whether you are having the permits or not or whether or not you are uh, paying the duties and on the other roads, we, uh, there will not be a necessity to check uh, your timber, because if you are taking it on any other routes, then you are automatically committing a, a forest offence. The government may prohibit the import or export or moving without a pass. Now, in this case, what we issue is known as a transit pass or a TP. Now, this transit pass contains details about where this material is taken from and where this material is moving. So, at every location uh, you will have to get your transit pass certified. So, what is happening is that suppose you are taking your forest produce from this location and you have. So, you are moving your forest produce like this from location A to location B. Now, in this case suppose you have three places where the these transit passes will be checked by the government or by the forest officials. So, what will happen is that at this location you will have a TP that is issued for the movement of this timber and as soon as you reach this point where uh, which is a, a, a which is a forest produce checking naka so in this case this tp will be checked and if everything is all right then the officer will sign or probably issue another tp and keep the first tp with himself then you go to this location and your tp is checked again then you go to this location and, and your tp is checked again now suppose a person went to the first one left out the second one and then moved to the third one what will happen then then there will then this will be considered to be a break in the uh, tp system and in this case this person will be required to go to this spot again get his tp verified and only then he will be allowed to move further on because this is a power that has been vested with the government so the government can not only prescribe the routes but the government can prescribe the import or export or moving of timber and other forest produce without a pass which is the transit pass provide for the issue production and return of such passes for payment of fees provide for stoppage reporting examination and marking of timber and other forest produce in transit so the government can stop you if you are carrying timber or other forest produce and the government can ask you to show where you are bringing all all of these from the government can examine your forest produce the government can even uh, mark your forest produce to ensure that you are not bringing in illicit forest produce or timber. So, the forest officers have been given all these powers by the government and through this act. 
the, uh, the government may provide for the establishment and regulation of depots, prohibit absolutely or subject to conditions within specified local limits, the establishment of saw pits, the converting, cutting, burning, concealing or marking of timber, the altering or effacing of any marks on the same or the position or carrying of marking hammers or the implements used for marking timber. Now, this section is giving the power to limit or prohibit the establishment of saw pits. Now, what is a saw pit? It is a location in which you are using a saw to convert your timber into specified sizes. So, those locations where you are doing these saw pit, the, uh, these, uh, these sawing operations can be, be prohibited or can be uh, limited that is prohibited subject to certain conditions. The government may prohibit or subject or uh, subject to conditions the converting, cutting, burning, concealing, marking of timber and so on. The government may regulate the use of property marks for timber, the registration of such marks, prescribe the time for which such registration shall hold good, limit the number of such marks that may be registered by any one person and provide for the levy of fees for such registration. Now, this, uh, uh, this act not only gives powers to the state government, but also to the, the central government, powers of central government as to movement of timber across customs frontiers. Then you have penalty for breach of rules under uh, this act. Next you have certain kinds of timber to be deemed property of government until title thereto proved and may be collected accordingly. Now, here we are talking about drift timber and stranded timber. Now, drift timber is something that is uh, that has drifted away say uh, through a waterway and stranded timber is something that you find stranded somewhere. Now, it is a common occurrence that whenever you catch hold of somebody with an illicit timber, he or she will say that okay, uh, I did not cut this tree, I just found it somewhere. Now, the act tries to close that loophole by saying that if somebody has found something, if it is a drift or standard timber, then it is a property of the government. So, in this case the person should have given this to the nearest forest officer. And so, if somebody says that uh, I just found this timber somewhere, then also he is committing an offence. Then the uh, section 51 is power to make rules and prescribe penalties. The state government in uh, can make rules to regulate the following matters, salving, collection and disposal of timber, use and registration of boats used in salving and collecting timber, amount to be pay, uh, paid for salving, collecting, moving, storing and disposing timber, use and registration of hammers and other instruments and so on. And if there is penalty for contravention, if there is a contravention, the penalty is 6 months or 500 rupees fine or both. Now, if there is a forest offence that is committed, then in the penalties section there can also be seizure of the property. So, the property can be seized from the person and what all can be seized? The, uh, the forest officer can seize the produce, so that is the timber and the other forest produce together with all tools, boats, carts or cattle that were used in committing such offence and they may be seized by either a forest officer or a police officer. So, this act provides for seizure of property, then uh, if the uh, property has been seized, it may be released or it may be confiscated. Now, when you confiscate something, it means that uh, this property has now become government property. So, the government may confiscate such property, if they find that, it, uh, that a forest offence has been committed. So, generally what we find is that in the uh, transportation of timber, you will find that, that there are certain vehicles that are being used to transport illicit timber from one place to another. So, in those cases we seize and confiscate not only the timber, but also the vehicle that was being used for such transport. So, typically it is a truck or a mini truck and uh, in that case uh, these trucks or mini trucks they become property of the government. Now, section 60 tells you property. Uh, went to waste in the government. So, uh, when an order of confiscation of any property has been passed under section 55 or 57, 
the period has elapsed, no appeal has been preferred or where, where there is an appeal, the appellate court has confirmed everything. So, the government get, gets this property and this property is free from all encumbrances. What does this mean? That if somebody had taken a loan on this particular vehicle, then the government only gets the vehicle, it does not get the loan. So, the government does not have to pay the loan. So, it is free from all encumbrances, there is nothing attached to this property. Next, the forest officers or the police or the police officers have the power to arrest without warrant, which means that these offenses are cognizable. What is the difference between a cognizable and a non cognizable offense? A cognizable offense is one where you can arrest a person without warrant. So, these are typically reserved for those offenses that are more grievous in nature, but then the government uh, this act prescribes that any forest offence is a grievous offence and so it is a cognizable offence. Any forest officer or police officer without orders from a magistrate and without a warrant can arrest any person against whom a reasonable suspicion exists of his having been concerned in any forest offence punishable with imprisonment for one month or upwards and that typically includes all the forest offences under this act. Then every forest officer and police officer has the power to prevent the commission of offences. Now, uh, every forest officer or and police officer shall prevent and may interfere for the purpose of uh, preventing the commission of any forest offence. So, it is not just that once a forest offence has been committed you can uh, hold a person, but even if you find that there is somebody who is getting into your forest to cut trees or maybe to light a fire then if you have a reasonable suspicion you can uh, stop that person from uh, from uh, doing a forest offence. Next you have power to try, uh, try offences summarily, the district magistrate or any magistrate of the first class specially empowered in this behalf by the state government may try summarily under the code of criminal procedure 1898 any forest offence punishable with imprisonment for a term not exceeding 6 months or fine not exceeding 500 rupees or both. So, there, there is a provision of summary trials, there is a provision of compounding the offences, presumption that forest produce belongs to the government, then you also have provisions for cattle trespass. So, cattle trespass act 1871 to apply, cattle trespassing in a reserve forest, any portion of a protected forest which has been lawfully close to grazing shall be deemed to be cattle doing damages to a public plantation under the meaning of section 2 of the cattle trespass act 1871 and may be seized and impounded by such forest officer or police officer. Next state government may invest forest officers with certain powers and what are these powers? These powers are power to enter upon any land and to survey, demarcate and make a map of the same. The powers of a civil court to compel the attendance of witnesses, production of documents and material objects, power to issue a search warrant under uh, CRPC uh, 1898 power to hold an inquiry into forest offences and in the course of such inquiry to receive and record evidence and any evidence recorded under clause D of subsection 1 shall be admissible in subsequent trial before a magistrate provided that it has been taken in the presence of the accused person. And forest officers are deemed to be public servants under the meaning of the IPC 1860. Then the government also uh, uh, has the power to make rules to prescribe and limit the powers and duties of any forest officer, to regulate the rewards to be paid to officers and informers out of the proceeds of fines and confiscation, to provide uh, for the preservation, reproduction and disposal of trees and timber belonging to government, but grown on lands belonging to or in the occupation of private persons and generally to carry out the provisions of this act. Then. Uh, the, the miscellaneous provisions include that persons are bound to assist forest officers and police officers. So, if you are there inside the forest, if you are uh, there in a depot, then you have to or you are bound to help the forest officers and police officers. So, these are the salient provisions of the, in, uh, of the uh, Indian Forest Act 1927. Next, we have a look at the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Now, the Wildlife Protection Act if we look at 
yeah so this is the the preliminary portion uh, this act okay this is the amendment act now uh, the wildlife protection act defines hunting with its grammatical variations and cognate expressions it includes killing or poisoning of any wild animal or captive animal and every attempt to do so so if somebody is trying to uh, attempt to kill a captive animal or to poison a wild animal that is hunting capturing coursing snaring trapping driving or baiting any wild or captive animal and every attempt to do so and injuring or destroying or taking any part of the body of such animal or in the case of wild birds and reptiles damaging the eggs of such birds or reptiles or disturbing the eggs or nest of such birds or reptiles. Now, the important thing to note here is that if somebody is trying to capture an animal. So, the person has not killed the animal, the person is only trying to capture the animal is attempting to capture or has actually captured, but in the case of the wildlife protection act this capturing will come under the definition of hunting. And so, all the provisions of hunting will apply even if you want to capture an animal. So, typically what happens is that uh, in a number of scientific expeditions people want to capture an animal and say uh, put a radio collar on top of the animal. So, that they are able to see where this animal is moving, but if you are trying to capture the animal then this is hunting and you will have to take all the requisite permissions. Similarly, if somebody is trying to bait an animal. So, suppose somebody is passing through a forest area and there are monkeys nearby and somebody is offering them kurkure or potato chips that is baiting of an animal and that is hunting and all the provisions of hunting shall apply in such case. Protected area means national park, sanctuary, conservation reserve, community reserve, weapon. What is a weapon? Now, the uh, wildlife protection act defines weapon as weapon includes ammunition, bows, arrows, explosives, firearms, hooks, knives, nets, prisons, uh, po uh, poison, snare, traps and any instrument or apparatus cap uh, capable of anesthetizing, decoying, destroying, injuring or killing an animal. Now, some suppose somebody has entered into uh, a wildlife area or a protected area with a vehicle can a vehicle be called as a weapon. So, here the uh, the law would ask whether the uh, the vehicle comes under this definition is a web is a vehicle capable of injuring or killing an animal if you bump your vehicle against an, an animal will the animal get injured if the answer is yes then your vehicle is a weapon. Similarly, if uh, somebody is taking a darting gun inside a forest to capture an animal. So, is that darting gun a weapon? You are not using it to kill the animal, you are only using it to anesthetize the animal to, uh, to be able to capture the animal. Now, in that case is your darting gun or the immobilizing gun is that a weapon? So, the answer is, is it a, an instrument or an apparatus that is capable of anesthetizing the animal? If it is yes, then yes your darting gun is a weapon. So, when we talk about the, the legal provisions we have to be very careful about what the act actually says. So, you, you cannot say that okay, uh, I was just using it to capture the animal and uh, my, uh, my darting gun will not be able to kill the animal. So, this is not a weapon you cannot take that recourse because the act has clearly stated what is a weapon, what is hunting and so on. Next, we look at some other important provisions chapter 3 hunting of wild animals. So, section 9 says that no person shall hunt any wild animals specified in schedule 1, 2, 3 and 4 except as provided under section 11 and section 12. So, there is a prohibition of hunting, there is not a ban on hunting. So, the wildlife protection act does not say that okay, you cannot hunt an animal it says that there is a prohibition, there is a limitation of hunting and you can only hunt as provided under section 11 and section 12. And section 11 and 12 they provide for certain circumstances. So, for instance section 11 says that hunting of wild animals is permitted 
in certain cases such as the chief wildlife warden may if he uh, if he is satisfied that any wild animal is specified in schedule 1 has become dangerous to human life or is so disabled or disease as to be beyond recovery. So, in the case of schedule 1 if it is dangerous to human life. Now, mind here that it is uh, it does not say dangerous to human life or to property. So, if there is an elephant an elephant comes under schedule 1. So, if there is an elephant that is entering into the fields of villagers and is destroying the, uh, the crops that are there. Can the chief wildlife warden make use of section 11 a? The answer is no, because it says if the animal is dangerous to human life not to property. Whereas, if you look at uh, section 11 b, it says the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer here the power is delegated even to the authorized officer um, as against uh, in section 11 a where the power is only with the chief wildlife warden. Now, in the case of section 11 b the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer may if he is satisfied that any wild animal specified in schedules 2, 3 or 4 has become dangerous to human life or to property including standing crops or any land. Then he or she may give the permission to hunt this animal. So, it is very important to keep in mind that when you are dealing with an animal whether it is a schedule 1 animal, whether it is a schedule 2 animal, schedule 3 animal, schedule 4 animal. So, you in the case of any animal you have to look at which schedule does it belong to. Then if you want to use make use of section 11 it is an emergency provision only to be used for very extreme circumstances. If you have an animal that has become dangerous to human life or is so diseased or disabled as to be beyond recovery. So, these are all extreme circumstances then you can make use of section 11 to hunt the animal. Otherwise you can take a permission under section 12 which says grant of permit for special purpose <coughs> and these purposes include education, scientific research, scientific management, collection of specimen derivation, collection or preparation uh, of a snake venom for the manufacturing of life saving drugs and so on. But here it says provided that no such permit shall be granted in respect of any wild animal specified in schedule 1 except with the previous permission of the central government and in respect of any other wild animal except with the previous permission of the state government. So, these are the riders that are provided even in section 12. Next section 17 a that was added later on with an amendment it says prohibition of picking uprooting etcetera of specified plants. So, even plants are protected under the wildlife protection act. Then you have dealing in specified plants without a license is prohibited. You have to declare your stock how much of this plant do you have possession of plants by licensee purchase of a specified plants, plants to be government property. Now, chapter 4 talks about protected areas, what is a, a sanctuary, how do you declare a sanctuary. Then in this case you have what are the restrictions in the sanctuary. So, you have restriction on entry in a sanctuary, no person other than a public servant on duty. So, you cannot be a public servant who is going on holiday then you do not come under this definition. You have to be a public servant on duty or a person who has been permitted by the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer to reside within the limits of the sanctuary or a person who has any right over immovable property within the limits of the sanctuary or a person who is passing through the sanctuary along a public highway and the dependents of such person referred to in clause a, b or c shall enter or reside in the sanctuary except under and in accordance with the conditions of a permit granted under section 28. So, it is now restricting the entry and residence of people inside the sanctuary and every person shall so long as he resides in the sanctuary be bound to prevent the commission in the sanctuary of an offence against this act where there is reason to believe that any such offence against this act has been committed in such sanctuary to help in discovering and arresting the off offender to report the death of any wild animal and to safeguard its remains 
until the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officer takes charge thereof to extinguish any fire in such sanctuary of which he has knowledge or information and to prevent from spreading by any uh, lawful means in his power any fire within the vicinity of such sanctuary of which he has knowledge or information and to assist any forest officer the chief wildlife warden wildlife warden or police officer demanding his aid for preventing and commission of any offence against this act or in the investigation of any such offence. So, even if you are getting a permit to enter a sanctuary you have also certain duties that you have to be mindful of. Then it says no person shall with intent to cause damage to any boundary mark of a sanctuary or to cause any wrongful gain as defined in the IPC 45 of 1860 alter destroy move or deface boundary marks and no person shall tease or molest any wild animal or litter the grounds of a sanctuary. Then under section 28 the chief wildlife warden can give a permit for under certain uh, for certain situations such as investigation, study of wildlife, photography, scientific research, tourism, transaction of lawful business when, with any person residing in a sanctuary. So, there are provisions that are available. Then section 29 is a very important section, it says that destruction etcetera and mind this word etcetera in a sanctuary prohibited without a permit. No person shall destroy, exploit or remove any wildlife including forest produce from a sanctuary. So, no person shall remove a forest produce from a sanctuary or destroy or damage or divert the habitat of any wild animal by any act whatsoever or divert, stop or enhance the flow of water into or outside the sanctuary except under and in accordance with a permit granted by the chief wildlife warden and no such permit shall be granted unless the state government being satisfied in consultation with the board and here the board is the state board of wildlife that such removal of wildlife from the sanctuary or change in the flow of water into or outside the sanctuary is necessary for the improvement and better management of wildlife therein authorizes the issue of such permit. So, what this section is saying is that you cannot uh, cause destruction in a sanctuary. Then causing of fire is prohibited, prohib uh, there is prohibition of entry into sanctuary with weapon, ban on use of injurious substances, Im immunization of livestock, registration of certain persons in possession of arms, power to remove encroachment. Then section 35 is declaration of national parks. How do you declare a national park? And in this case also you have all different restrictions that are there, no grazing is permitted, all the other sections uh, uh, section 27, 28, 30, 32. Uh, shall apply in the case of national parks. Then you have uh, conservation reserve that is managed by a conservation reserve management committee and then you have a community reserve and community reserve management committee. So, this act is now telling you about what all things can be done and cannot be done in these areas. Then trade or commerce in wild animals, animal articles and trophies. So, wild animal etcetera are government properties. If you are in possession of an animal article trophy or uncured trophy then you have to declare it to the government. Then there is inquiry and preparation of inventories you need to have a certificate of ownership, regulation of transfer of animal, dealings in trophies and animal articles without licenses prohibited and so on. You have to maintain records, restriction of transportation of wildlife, prohibition of trade or commerce in trophies, animal articles etcetera derived from certain animals. So, these are different prohibitions <coughs> or different provisions that are made available in the act. Now, to prevent it and detect uh, offences, the forest officers are given the power to entry, search, arrest and detain people. And then there are certain penalties that have also been prescribed. And this is an important section, attempts and abetment. Whoever attempts to contravene or abets the contravention, so you are not, uh, you have not contravened any provision, but you are just attempting to do it. So you have not uh, hunted an animal; you are just attempting to hunt it, or you are helping somebody to attempt to hunt it. So whoever attempts to contravene or abets the contravention of any provisions of this act 
or for any rule of order made there under shall be deemed to have contravened that provision or rule or order as the case may be. So, you were so basically what this is talking about is that uh, you did not fire the gun, you did not kill the animal, you just went together with the hunter and you told him where the animal was located. But in this case, because you have abetted the contravention of a provision of this act, you shall be guilty of having contravened the act itself. So, it shall be deemed to be deemed to have contravened that provision or rule or order as the case may be. So, even if you are hunting somebody to contravene the provisions of this act, then you will be guilty or deemed to be guilty of that particular contravention itself. You cannot take up uh, take a plea that I did not fire the gun or if you are attempting to, to do something wrong. So, for instance, you went into the uh, forest to say hunt a tiger, but you were not able to hunt the tiger before you could hunt uh, this tiger you were caught. But in this case the same clause will apply as if you have already hunted the tiger, because the attempt is taken to be equal to the contravention. So, these are the important provisions of the wildlife protection act. Next we have a look at the forest conservation act 1980. Now, Forest Conservation Act is a very simple act, it is a very small act, an act to provide for conservation of forests and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental there to as simple as that. So, this is an act for the conservation of forest. Now, what does this say? Section 2, now, section 2 is also something that we had referred to before in the Godavarman case. Restriction on de-reservation of forest or use of forest land for non forest purpose. So, there is a restriction on the de-reservation of forest. So, you cannot uh, if there is a forest you cannot say that it has now become a de-reserved area or use of forest land for non forest purpose. So, you cannot say that okay, this land is still a forest, but I am using it for agriculture or say I am using it for tourism. You cannot do that there are restrictions. Now, what are the restrictions? Notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force in a state, no state government or authority. Now, this is a central act and it says that no state government or other authority shall make except with the prior approval of the central government any order directing that any reserve forest or any portion thereof shall cease to be reserved any forest land or any portion thereof may be used for any non forest purpose, any forest land or portion thereof may be assigned by way of lease or otherwise to any private person or to any authority, corporation, agency or any other organization not owned, managed or controlled by the government. That any forest land or any portion thereof may be cleared of trees which have grown naturally in that land or portion for the purpose of using it for afforestation as simple as that. And then this act further gives an explanation. So, explanation is for the purpose of this section non forest uh, purpose means breaking up or clearing of any forest land or portion thereof for the cultivation of tea, coffee, spices, rubber, palm, oil bearing plants, horticultural crops or medicinal plants. So, essentially if you are saying that okay, I am cutting these trees and I am going to grow a, a palm plantation. So, is that permitted? Answer is no, because a growing of a palm plantation is a non forestry activity under this act or any other purpose other than reforestation, but does not include any work relating to or ancillary to conservation, development and management of forest and wildlife namely. So, certain activities are permitted and these are establishment of check post, fire lines, wireless communication construction of fencing, bridges, culverts, dams, water holes, trench marks, boundary uh, marks, pipelines or other like purposes. And the contravention is very simple, uh, the, the penalty for the contravention is very simple. Section 3a, whoever contravenes or abets the contravention of any of the provisions of section 2 shall be punishable with simple imp imprisonment for a period which may extend to 15 days, just 15 days of simple imprisonment. But just because uh, 
the scope of this act is very wide. So, this has been extremely effective in protecting our forests, because it, uh, uh, it stops the official conversion or official handing over of forest for non forest purposes. So, in today's lecture we had a look at, uh, uh, at three acts of forest uh, protection, we looked at the Indian Forest Act 1927, the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 and the Forest Conservation Act 1980 and especially those provisions that are helping us to protect our forests. So, that is all for today, thank you for your attention, Jai Hind.